assessing the effects of ecological impacts on Michele Grande's detritus production and use as a natural deep sea EDMA sampler. All right, so first of all, let's talk about what are marine sponges. So marine sponges are members of the phylum periphera, and they're actually one of the oldest multicellular animal groups on the planet. And because they're so old, they actually have a very simple body plan in the sense that they don't have any organized tissues or organs. <coughs> Instead, their bodies are made up of specialized cells that work together for the sole purpose of filter feeding. Despite their simplicity, sponges are extremely versatile. There are thousands of classified species, they come in a variety of shapes, colors, and sizes, and they can be found anywhere from shallow tropical waters to deep, polar seas. Now, despite their versatility and abundance, because of their sort of unassuming, just simplistic filtering nature, marine sponges have long been ignored throughout history. Um, and while, marine, while research on these sponges has surged in the last few decades, their mainstream popularity is still extremely minimal. So when I got the opportunity to learn about sponges over summer, I was hooked, and I knew immediately that I wanted to conduct a project that spread awareness not only in how cool sponges were, but one that really emphasized their multifaceted importance. And I decided to do this by conducting two distinct experiments. In one experiment, I wanted to dive into the ecological of sponges, looking at how shallow water species were being affected by oceanic threats such as pollution and climate change. In the second experiment, I wanted to dive into a scientific application of sponges, looking at how deep water species can be used as a tool for biodiversity monitoring. The goal was for these two different experiments to work together to exemplify just how broad and exciting the field of sponge research really is. All right, so on to experiment one, looking at the ecological importance of shallow water species. So about 10 years ago, it was discovered that sponges are critical to nutrient cycling on coral reefs through a process known as the sponge loop. Now, one of the interesting things about coral reefs is that despite their high biodiversity, they're actually extremely low on nutrients, and this has confused marine scientists for a long time. So dissolved organic matter, um, or DOM, consists of nutrients that are released into the water as byproducts. And as their name suggests, um, they're dissolved into the water and essentially are unusable by most organisms to uptake. And this is where sponges come in. So sponges have a unique ability to actually uptake this untapped dissolved organic matter and convert it into something known as sponge detritus. This sponge detritus, which is essentially just sponge poop, essentially is able to serve as a basal food and nutrient source for the entire coral reef. Now, when I first heard about this process, there was one question that immediately came to my mind, and that was, how is this process being affected by ocean threats such as pollution and climate change? So that is exactly what I decided to test. Specifically, I wanted to look at how is the detritus production of shallow water species being affected by variables including nutrients, microplastic, and sunscreen pollution, as well as raised temperatures. And again, the goal of this first study was to determine, um, was to emphasize the ecological importance of sponges. All right, so the species used for this experiment is known as Michaelis grandis, aka the orange keyhole sponge. I chose this guy because it's a very resilient species, it's known to produce a fair amount of detritus, and it was easy for me to collect. So first, specimens were collected in the shallow waters at Panyohe Bay, and then transferred into a student-built research tub at my school. From there, they were sectioned off into pieces roughly 6 by 6 centimeters, and then sutured onto plastic mesh plates. And I made about 30 or so of these replicates in order to have an ample amount for statistical analysis later on. All right, so to simulate the effects of the different impacts on the sponges, exposure simulations were set up in separate five-gallon tanks. Each tank was filled with filtered seawater, which acted as the control, and there was a separate tank for each variable. So for example, there was one tank with raised microplastics, one tank with raised nutrients, etc., etc. In total, there were five replicates in each tank. Exposure lasted for seven days, and observational data as well as pictures was taken throughout the exposure period. So after the seven day exposure period, it was time for the actual detritus collection. Now, the sponges were then transferred from their exposure tanks into an apparatus that I fondly call the sponge toilet. Uh, and the sponge toilet does about exactly what it sounds like. Essentially, its sole purpose is to collect this sponge detritus. So um, what it is is a PVC apparatus that has two holders down the middle. Um, into these collection tubes, a glass funnel was placed. And on top of that glass funnel, the sponge replicate was placed upside down in order to collect the detritus. After the detritus collection, the tube was removed, the detritus was dried thoroughly, and then weighed on a precision balance. In total, there were two sets of trials conducted during detritus collection. Um, an initial five-day trial in which detritus was collection, collected for five days, and then a longer-term trial in which detritus was collected for 10 days, with measurements being taken on the fifth and tenth day of each trial, in order to see whether or not um, detritus production was able to recover over time. All right, so on to our first results. So just to look at some of the observations seen during the exposure simulations, the control and nutrient sponges seemed healthy throughout the trials with no visible changes. The sunscreen group, um, could, there was a thin white film that could be seen forming over these sponges. <coughs> However, otherwise they appeared healthy throughout the treatment. 
In the microplastic group, the tissue of the sponge is visibly darkened, and there were clear microplastics that could be seen touching the surface of the sponge. Um, and as you can probably tell by these pictures, the heated group is the one that took the biggest hit. So by day three of the exposure, they had developed a thick gray film over each of the replicates, and by the end of the exposure, there was clear sponge decay and overall sponge depth. As for the actual detritus production, what you're looking at here is a graph showing the detritus product produced between all of the treatments. And as you can probably tell, the control group actually produced significantly more detritus than all the treatments except for the nutrient treatment. Um, and as noted here, the heated group produced zero grams of detritus, which was expected considering each of the replicates were actually dead. As for the 10-day trial, the results were much the same. The control group produced significantly more detritus at all the data points than both of the microplastic and sunscreen groups. And overall, um, the, between the treatments themselves, detritus production was not able to rebound from days 5 through 10. So this data showed us that microplastic, sunscreen, and raised temperatures significantly decreased detritus production, and the only treatment that these sponges showed any real resilience towards was the nutrient pollution. Um, the sponge mortality in the heated group suggests that global warming could be a serious threat to sponges and is definitely something to monitor. As for the 10-day trials, um, the detritus production, the data showed us that the detritus production does not recover from these environmental impacts over the course of 10 days. And this highlights a potentially lingering effect of environmental stressors on detritus production. So overall, this first study helped to reveal the serious implications that these stressors have on sponges and definitely has implications towards overall reef health. Um, by continuing to study this sort of thing, we may be able to develop conservation and management strategies with sponges in mind. As a whole, this first study helped to exemplify that sponges are super important and the sponge loop is something that must be continued to be preserved and studied. Alright, so on to experiment number two, which was diving into a practical application of deep sea sponges. So the goal of this second experiment was to assess the effectiveness of deep sea species as biodiversity monitoring tools. Now what does that actually mean? So, Biodiversity has to do with the variety of life that you see in the ecosystem. It can reflect things such as ecosystem health, and overall is an important metric for biologists. But as you can imagine, measuring this type of data in an environment such, and that's so intense, such as the deep sea, is extremely difficult. And this is where DNA techniques become essential. So environmental DNA, or eDNA, is essentially any DNA that's released from an organism into the environment. And this can be anything from waste, to tissue particles, or whatever it may be. Now, the presence of this eDNA allows for efficient and non-invasive biodiversity monitoring. Essentially, all you have to do is get a sample of whatever medium you're working with, so in our case, a water sample, and then extract and, de extract and sequence the eDNA that is present, giving you, allowing you to get a snapshot of the biodiversity in that ecosystem. Now, as you can imagine, because of how slow life is in the deep sea, there are often low eDNA concentrations in typical water samples, and this is where sponges come in. So because of their intense filter feeding nature, it's been proposed that sponges may be able to actually collect and concentrate eDNA within their tissue, allowing sponge tissue to act as a sort of natural eDNA filter or sampler. So in this um, experiment specifically, we wanted to ask, can deep sea sponges act as natural eDNA samplers, and what, if any, different animal groups are they capable of detecting? Again, the second experiment was done with the goal of emphasizing just another practical use for sponges. All right, so thanks to the amazing Dr. Jean Vicente from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, I was able to get my hands on nine different deep sea sponge samples. These guys were collected on the Nautilus ROV from 1,000 to 3,000 meters deep um, around the waters of Kingman and Palmyra Atoll. So the first step um, for this experiment was to actually identify the species of each of our samples. So what we did was we extracted the DNA from these sponge samples. We then amplified this DNA using PCR with two sponge-specific primers. The products were then ran on gel and sent off to another lab for Sanger sequencing. Once we got the sequences back, we then aligned them, aligned and trimmed them, and then blasted them in order to determine their species. Alright, after the sponge identification, it was time for the actual eDNA assessment. So, the sponge-derived DNA from the last step was then used as a DNA template for a new set of PCR reactions using MUTE-S and JGC01 primers. JGC01 is a universal invertebrate primer that, is meant to, that was meant to amplify any invertebrate eDNA that may have been present within the sponge tissue. So essentially, we were looking for invertebrates. MUTE-S, on the other hand, is an octocoral specific primer, and it was meant to target deep sea octocorals. While we haven't actually gotten to the sequencing of the eDNA, we already have some exciting results, and they came from somewhere that we weren't expecting. All right, so the results for the sponge identification. Surprisingly, we were only able to identify five of our samples successfully as being sponges, and they showed up as four different species of glass sponge of the family Hexactinella. 
Now, the exciting results come with the other three that were identified. These three samples actually showed up as three different species of invertebrates, um, including Antidon bifida, the rosy feather star, as well as two different species of hydrozoa. And what this means is that somewhere in our samples and somewhere along the PCR process, DNA from these other animals was accidentally amplified. So the fact that invertebrates were found during the sponge identification is a super promising sign. It definitely means that there's eDNA present within our samples. This is especially exciting considering one of our immediate next steps is to actually sequence the JGC01 PCR product, which is meant to specifically target this invertebrate eDNA. In terms of experiments in progress, we're currently working on library prep for both of the primers, um, optimizing the PCR for the new S, as well as we plan to test universal fish primers. So as you can tell, there's a ton to be done in this second study, but definitely a promising outlook. As a whole, I hope this study helped to emphasize just how important sponges are. Anywhere from shallow tropical waters to deep polar seas, they can be found to be important towards the environment as well as towards novel scientific applications. And not to mention the fact that they're just super cool. Uh, I'd like to thank the Uninformatics team at Ilani School. Thank you so much to Mr. Hill, Mr. Tong, Dr. Chan, Ms. Kobayashi, um, Dr. John Vicente from the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology, the REMS program, my teacher, Ms. Seki, and of course, my family. And thank you to you guys for allowing me to pre present my research here today.